me to forget it and I bet you will forget it when you find me in the morning wet and drowned and the world gets round I'm going down I'm going down I'm coming up for air it's pretty stuff under there like I said I didn't care but I forgot to leave a note and it's so hard to stay afloat I'm soaking wet without a boat and I knew I should have taken off my shoes it's front page news going nation driven by energy. We're fueled by the resilient farmers across the nation and connected through integral rail systems spanning coast to coast delivering goods in mass quantity. On top of those necessary functions in our society, there's other things we seem to take for granted as well. Everyday life would be vastly different without personal automobiles and access to airplanes. These complex industries keeping such transportation feasible for you and I often aren't appreciated the way that they should be. With so many moving parts in both the machines and the workforce of employees, it's amazing to have what we have. But is now the time to just say that what we have is good enough and we should just stop innovating? Say that we're fine where we are? Well, the plane we saw on my way in, it's about to fly me out of Bellingham. And the operation it's undergoing right now is called a turnaround. In under an hour, employees will pump 1,500 gallons of fuel back on board, unload passengers, load more passengers on, along with taking their luggage off, loading new ones on. They also service lavatories, and that's just the surface of these operations. Turnaround time is a crucial element in the operating efficiency of an airline. Most often, the shorter the turnaround time, the better it is for the airline and the passenger, and that's important. But hey, beyond all that turnaround stuff, I gotta go on vacation. I gotta go catch my plane. Looks like I won't be needing this. Like I was getting at, efficiency is a top priority of the aviation industry. Take, for instance, the 737 MAX. Its larger engines promise greater efficiency over its competitors. New winglets offered greater reduction in drag, as swirling, inefficient vortices of air flow easier and less noticeably off the tip of this wing thanks to the shape of the wing itself. Here's an example of these vortices curling off the trailing edge of a 777 flap. The extreme humidity of the air around it provides a great environment for visualizing this force we typically can't see with our eyes. The air around the plane can only support a certain amount of humidity before that suspended water begins to condensate and fall. The wing passes through the air and creates a low pressure environment which is no longer capable of supporting as much water. Though even when water isn't present, these forces of drag still exist and cost the airline extra money and fuel. But more efficient doesn't always equate to better. Now as I'm sure you're aware, the 737 MAX had some fatal flaws in this. Uh, the larger engines that they mounted, although they were more efficient, they were too big for the airframe, and it altered the flight characteristics of the plane and it made it more sensitive to fly. Now, although the MAX was a step in the right direction, it wasn't on the right path, and I've seen some other steps that have me concerned about what path they're on, too. Now, electric aircraft, although they are a step in the right direction, I'm just not convinced they're on the right path. They've got too many things about them that really just wouldn't be suitable for aviation. We're going to take a deeper look into this soon. The future of aviation really lies in the fuels the aircraft use to fly. Electric-powered cars already grace our streets, so could it be time for this technology to work its way into the skies? Well, even if our battery technology advances greatly, there's one unavoidable flaw all battery-powered planes do and would have. They wouldn't become lighter in weight as they fly, and that's a crucial factor in aviation.
although this simple and rather crude demonstration isn't a perfect comparison between batteries and combustible fuel, it'll bring the realities of weight versus energy to light. Here, I have a tin tray weighing in at 0.2 ounces, but I'll zero that out and add 0.8 ounces of Douglas fir wood. What's its competition? For now, we've got two AAA batteries, also weighing in at 0.8 ounces. Burning this wood, we release what energy it has, and when it's done, it's again light enough to be accidentally blown away by the wind. And weighing up the burnt remnants shows that it lost 0.6 ounces of weight. That's 75% of its weight gone. And as for the batteries, they remain the same weight, dead or alive. So, no surprise, burning fuel releases byproducts that make the consumer for fuel weigh less. So now, let's compare the energy output of each when their weight is the same. For this test, I'll be measuring their energy in BTUs, as it's suitable for both fuels. After all, heat is a simple way of measuring energy. Remember, this is a comparison of energy per ounce, not energy to volume. Batteries are great for packing a lot of energy in a compact space, but this comes at the expense of increasing its mass, which is exactly what airplanes need to avoid. First things first, we just burned 0.8 ounces of Douglas fir wood. Let's find out how many BTUs 0.8 ounces has. Douglas fir is 21 million BTU per cord, and one cord is 128 cubic feet, while Douglas fir weighs 31 pounds per cubic foot. Do some quick math, and we realize that one cord of Douglas fir wood weighs 3,968 pounds. There are 16 ounces in one pound. Multiply that by 3,968 and we'll discover that a cord of Douglas fir wood weighs 63,488 ounces. Now, we need to spread that 21 million BTU evenly across these 63,000 ounces. We'll use division to realize that it equals 337 BTUs per ounce. And since we're only working with 0.8 ounces, let's scale that down a bit more to 269 BTUs. Now for the battery. I went ahead and chose a more powerful and rechargeable battery that still weighs the same as the wood, at 0.8 ounces. The battery I chose is a hobby zone 7.4 volt, 300 milliamp hour, or 2.2 watt hour, lithium polymer battery. A quick Google search gives me an equation to find out how many total joules is in this battery. I plug the specifications of the battery into the equation to find out this specific battery has 7,992 joules. Here's the bummer though. One joule equals only 0 0.00095 BTUs. When we multiply this out, we find that this battery only has 7.6 BTUs, while the Douglas fir had 269. The wood had the upper hand in this competition, as it had a larger volume than the battery. But volume isn't a concern here, it's weight that aircraft are concerned about. Now, why is losing weight so important for an aircraft? If they could take off with a certain amount of weight, why should they need to shed any? And though this thinking makes sense, landing at the same weight simply isn't feasible. Every plane has a maximum takeoff weight and a maximum landing weight for a reason. One dictates the limit at which it can no longer get off the ground, and the other represents the maximum weight it can be when landing before it would shatter into pieces upon touchdown. Take for instance the Q400 plane I was chasing in the beginning. The maximum takeoff weight, or MTOW, for a Q400 is 64,500 pounds, and the maximum landing weight or MLW, is 61,750 pounds. These differences become more apparent when we take a look at larger intercontinental aircraft. The 777-300ER is an aircraft capable of carrying 396 passengers 7,370 nautical miles. It has an MTOW of 775,000 pounds, while that MLW is 554,000 pounds. The wheels can support three quarters of a million pounds while standing on the ground because it's experience in 1G. Landing though is different, as planes often experience gravitational pulls greater than 1G if adverse weather slams it into the ground when landing. If aircraft use batteries instead of burnable fuel, the frames of the planes would have to be reinforced to land at heavier weights. But then we enter a vicious cycle. Batteries aren't as powerful as jet fuel, so you need more batteries. More batteries, you need more reinforcement. More reinforcement means more weight, and more weight which means you need more power, and then more batteries, and you get the idea. Up to this point, all I've done is explain how conventional solutions to cleaner energy aren't feasible in aviation. Seems like I'd rather keep ragging on progress than applaud what work has been done. But here's where I'm coming from. Alternative fuels, especially carbon neutral fuels, are a relatively new concept. 
There's plenty of new fuel sources we can pioneer, and I'm tired of hearing the same old one. Batteries, batteries, batteries. They aren't the fix-all for our existing platforms. And with that, I don't believe any individual fuel is suitable in all cases. I believe in the right tool for the job, which is why I'm excited to introduce what I believe will be the next big thing fueling aviation. Allow me to introduce biofuel. Well, more specifically, algae biofuel. It has the properties of a fuel that aircraft require while also being carbon neutral. I'll mention this much right away. I am intentionally ignoring the funding required to competitively bring this fuel into the market. Any new fuel is going to require plenty of excessive funding, mainly because existing sources are so predominant, affordable, and accessible. I believe the best way to get these new fuels to market, though, is through public interest. You've got to make it cool to use the new fuel, and once it grows a following of users, it'll take off on its own. And on the note of public interest, I ran a quick survey on algae biofuel. Everyone I surveyed had heard of biofuel, but when I asked specifically of algae biofuel, that number dropped to 40%. My audience was more familiar with oil-based biofuels, popularized through recycling of fryer oil to create these fuels. Now these alternatives, though, cake up engines with buildup as they run. Algae seems to have a level head for the treatment of engine internals. It's already being tested in aircraft, and it's exceeding expectations. Testing the fuel in a twin-engine DA-42 aircraft proved more efficient than traditional jet fuel. Algae was featured in the 2010 Farnborough Air Show, a major trade exhibition show with a 200,000 person attendance. Though this publicity was beneficial, it's going to take a lot more for this fuel to become competitive. I believe that if we inform the public on how algae biofuel is made, a lot more of us will be excited to implement it in our daily lives. When the algae is grown for the fuel, it takes in CO2. Though burning it does release CO2, it will only release as much as what it took in during growth hence the carbon neutral designation. Though it's going to take a Herculean effort to get this new fuel into market, it'll pay out in the long run. Airlines will soon be opting for algae biofuel, as current aircraft can be powered by it with minimal alteration. No major operating changes will be necessary, which will streamline the transition to these renewable sources. There's no need to reinvent the wheel, but the wheels will certainly have to adapt to the terrain it encounters. And as always, keep those tuber fans humming.